welcome my gentle and obviously very modern apes. Very gentle, very modern, business as usual with you guys. And welcome to another episode of the Library of Error. I am beyond psyched for today's episode because we are covering my favorite chapter in the entire book, Missing Links Revisited by the Immaculate Raw Matt uh, and Standing for Truth as well. This is, of course, a chapter, uh, they call it an appendix, it's basically just another chapter. The, the appendices make up like half this book, so I'm just going to call them chapters. Uh, of this incredible tome, Why Human Evolution is False, the scientific case for independent origins has ape to man evolution a bit overturned by YouTubers standing for truth. So we're, we're getting closer and closer to just finishing this thing. I can't wait because then we're moving on to something uh, a little better formatted, which is to say we're going to be doing Contested Bones by Sanford and Roop. Oh, that one's going to take a long time. There is arguably more wrong in that text than this one, but, you know, again, at least it's easier on the eyes. <laughs> and they're sources instead of hyperlinks, so um, I'm ready to dig into this, but before we do, there are a few... Um, points of order, I suppose, that I want to get to. The first is that I am wearing a shirt designed by friend of the channel, Josiah Hansen's significant other, actually, and it is uh, a great shirt. It says Young Earth Creationism, the other flat earth. It's got a little baby, little baby young, young Earth right there, a little rattle, a little, little bonnet. Um, <laughs> it's a great shirt, very breathable material, and I'll put that link in the description, so thank you very much, Josiah. And other point of order, I've also stuck a link in the description to a Creation Ministries International article that features yours truly and, uh, of course, Dan, Dr. Dan Stern Carnell, because we were criticizing some of Robert Carter's work earlier in the month and, or earlier within the past 30 days, I suppose you should say, um, and, and <laughs> I think we got a little miffed about it, so they wrote an article about us. It's just so funny. You're, it's gut-busting. I really enjoyed it. It's, it's also um, very specific on how they don't quite like my conduct. I'm too sassy. So I always thought of myself as relatively fair and even-headed with the reviews that I do, but so be it. You can't please everyone all the time. That's the lesson that you gotta learn. So let's... <laughs> speaking of lessons, uh, let's let's get taught by our teachers here. So, <laughs> as we have seen throughout the course of this book, the best evidence for human evolution has been overturned. This not only goes for genetic related evidence, but also for fossil evidence. The examples of so-called transitional forms are better understood as human people groups who have undergone accelerated genetic degradation. This genetic degradation is due to inbreeding following the Babel dispersion since some people groups became isolated. The result of isolation and inbreeding was genetic compromise and genetic decline. These facts explain the primitive features that proponents of evolution see as evidence for their transition from ape to man. All of these observations are in accord with the post-Babel dispersion of migration by various people groups. With that out of the way, let us look at the long line of supposed missing links that evolutionists have pointed to throughout the history of this controversy. This way you can see for yourself just how much false information the evolutionary community has promoted. Missing links? The entire chain is missing. Now, <laughs> I, I hope you're ready for this very, very long chapter of, um, well, <sighs> I don't know how to address it kindly, so I think we we're best our best course of action here is to just go through it, so you can kind of see what we're dealing with here. I know you've gotten a taste of it previously. It, this this one reads very much like Ramat's other chapter, which is to say, um, poorly. It's not very well composed. There are a lot of cribbed pictures that aren't sourced, uh, and most importantly, much of the information is is just wrong. It's just very blatantly incorrect. In fact, we actually start off with one like that. That's just, whew, wrong on the face of it. <laughs> um, so let's let's jump in. Oh, but before we do, I, I do hope you appreciate the, the explanation for these missing links, right? So they, they've got the missing links and the entire thesis of this chapter is the missing links are fraudulent. Uh, except when they're a result of genetic degradation. And what you are going to find is that how they decide whether it's a fraud or genetic degradation is like directly proportional to how transitional it is. Um, or 
like how little research raw mat has done. It really does depend on whether or not Standing or raw mat wrote that portion. And you can usually tell who wrote it. Standing is a bit more well-spoken. Um, a bit, I should say. Uh, he is responsible for this text. His name is on the front then. Uh, as we know, it's not exactly well formatted. So let's not give him too much credit. And, um, and um, let's just start. Below are all frauds, lies, and mistakes sold to the public eye to make ape to man evolution appear to be true. But let's investigate, shall we? Yes, Ramat. Shall we investigate? Number one, Nebraska Man, or Hesperopithecus Herald Cookieye. Nebraska Man was sold as a missing link until it was discovered to be a fraud. The tooth belonged to an extinct pig. It was actually a peccary, if memory serves. Fossils can often sing any song you wish them to. This is just one of the many proofs of that. Um, and then he's got, like, a picture of Java Man. <laughs> like, a completely different, um, non-fraudulent hominin. Uh, with like an asterisk by it, and oh, okay, okay, I see, I see. He goes, he goes into it. Following that, on the next page, let's discuss Nebraska Man first. It's a tooth that belonged to a peccary, which is it's kind of like a pig. Uh, pig molars do look very similar to human molars. Um, I, I have, I have a uh, jaw back here. Um, especially the premolars are quite similar to what we see in our own jaws. But the important bit is, like, the one who discovered that Nebraska Man was not actually a hominin tooth, it was an anthropologist, right? It was like it was a young earth creationist. I mean, it was proposed as a hominin tooth by someone who, like, wasn't in that field. Like, someone who was basically like, oh, this kind of looks like a hominin tooth. Uh, let's name it after me. <laughs> and then anthropologists came along and they were like, mm, that's not a, that's not a hominin tooth. That's a, that's a peccary tooth. So... You know, problem proposed by non-anthropologists, solved by anthropologists. So I don't know that that's a great example for them to be using as, like, anthropology bad, since um, the anthropologists were the ones that sorted it out. Java Man, like, he just starts by saying it's pure fraud, right, as you can see right there. Java Man just is a hominin skullcap, right? Like, it just is a Homo erectus skullcap. And what's particularly weird about this is that creationists accept Homo erectus. So like, so like, what's the problem here? You know, I mean, they think Homo erectus is just a degenerate human uh, due to genetic entropy. So why why get upset about Java Man if it's just Homo erectus? Like, they're not even getting their own lines of thought straight. Nothing but the skull cap of a chimp sold as a missing link since 1994 or 1894. Eugene Dubois' central claim was that uh, Pithecanthropus was a transitional form between apes and humans, a so-called missing link. Um, I mean, it's just Homo erectus. That's just like common knowledge. It's considered to be uh, a bit earlier than Peking Man, another Homo erectus uh, specimen. I don't know where he's getting the idea that this is like a chimp skull cap. It, it's quite large. It's, definitely a bit too large to be a chimp skullcap, uh, which is kind of funny because, like, they show that right there. They show how ancient, like, they were proposing ancient chimpanzees were just huge in order to make it be a skullcap of a chimp. And they're just, like, making more issues for themselves because, again, you know, Java Man is not controversial to creationists. So, I mean, to me, this this feels like, uh, this feels like a stumble for, for the for the model, for the working model. Okay, Otabenga, fully human, just a pygmy young man from the Congo. A lie and fraud 100%. Sold as evolutionary missing link. He was thrown in a zoo with bones scattered around him to look like he was a cannibal. He eventually committed suicide out of depression. This is just one of the many tragedies the philosophy of evolution has led to. Um, and like, it, I'm not really 100% sure how he's making the point that it was anthropologists that proposed that a, a man from a sort of um, a pygmy from Africa, they use very outdated language, was some kind of missing link. Because even the pictures that he shows here, they have nothing to do with evolution or, or any kind of missing link. Uh, Otobenga, pygmy, tired of America, strange little African, finally ended his life at Lynchburg. Bushman shares a cage with Bronx Zoo Park apes, laughs over his antics, many are not pleased, you know, and it's basically just a, hor a bunch of horrible uh, accounts of something terrible that was done to this to this man. 
But it wasn't that, like in the name of evolution. At least Ramat doesn't present any support that it was. I mean, you know, okay. Not a not a missing link. It wasn't proposed as a missing link. Just a horrible, horrible tragedy sown by racism and other, you know, moronic ideas. Okay, Peking man, uh, Sinanthropist Pekinensis. It's just Homo erectus. I just mentioned that a second ago. Peking man is, is just a Homo erectus specimen. This is yet another hoax. The bones have been conveniently lost, yet still is sold as an evolutionary missing link in museums to this day. Um, no. I mean, <laughs> I don't really know what to say about some of these other than just that's not correct. I mean... This is what I mean, okay? <laughs> Java Man just is a member of Homo erectus? I mean, you can see... Oops, I didn't mean to do that. You can see the skull cap attributed to it here, as well as uh, some of the long bones that have been, like, previously given to it. The femur, skull cap, stuff like that. Things of that nature. And it's especially weird to me that this is a hill that uh, Raw Matt feels like dying on. Uh, because Java Man and Peking Man are both, again, they're, they're, they're Homo erectus. <laughs> I've never met a creationist that has a problem with Homo erectus. They just shove them into the human category and call it a day. Um, Peking Man, same way. Um, oops, Peking Man. Just another member of Homo erectus. What is that? No internet? Give me the internet back. Eh. We're dealing with something that's quite similar here. I mean, it's it's the only difference between Java Man and Peking Man is Peking Man has um, a larger brain case. So it's considered to be a more derived member of Homo erectus, but they share enough that their Venn diagrams of their, of their traits share enough that they're both attributed to Homo erectus. They're not unique species. And like, no one thinks they're frauds. <laughs> so, I, I don't know. I don't know why Ramat, you know, feels like uh, feels like hashing this one out. I know that the YouTube channel that he partners with, the Standing for Truth the YouTube channel, they tend to be pro Homo erectus. So take that as you will. Damn, this book back. The next oh boy, the next one that we talk about is um, Orse Man. Orse Man. This one is not very commonly brought up because Orse Man is kind of a weird case. The last word on Orse Man seems to be that it it's like a 2012 paper, I believe it was, seems to say that it's from a ruminant. Um, but the reason why it was so controversial, but let me let me back up. So Orse Man, <laughs> he says, this proven fraud was deliberately sold as human before testing and was from a four month donkey skull. So one, like, Yes, there was quite a bit of controversy around Orse Man. Uh, it was a very small skull cap that was attributed to a hominin. In my opinion, and in the opinion of many legitimate paleoanthropologists, this was a jump of the gun. Um, particularly because this was like one of the earlier hominin-ish looking remains that was found in Europe. And so it was a big deal at the time. Spain really wanted to capitalize on this and claim first hominin um, kind of status there. But as time went on, in 2012, like I said, uh, the, the skull cap was tested and it's believed to have come from a, a female ruminant. Um, it, we're not really looking at like the four month old donkey in that case. I mean, I, I don't think that anyone is actually holding that um, as, as like the final, the final say on the matter. But the more important thing to consider and to appreciate with Orsay Man is I mean, we've got hundreds of, of hominins that date around Orsay Man or, or indeed even earlier from Europe, right? So it's like, e even then, it's it's no longer considered to be very controversial um, due to its dating, but more so because of the jump of the gun and, and the fact that it, it aligns more with ruminants than it does with hominins. So, I mean... I don't know. I don't know anybody who's like holding Orse Man as like the pinnacle of human evolution. It's like a skull cap like that big. We've got way better transitional forms to point to. All right. <laughs> oh boy. All right. Gigantopithecus. We always love Gigantopithecus. Uh, dropped by anthropologists as too improbable by 1950. I just put, I just put, nope. <laughs> That's just not at all the case. And, uh, you know, again, I, I can't stress this enough. Like, I know, I know that at least Standing for Truth, or Monkey for Bananas, he likes to be called, doesn't hold the Gigantopithecus as like a fake, a fake hominid. 
so I don't know why this chapter is like espousing that, but uh, I mean, I guess we better, I guess we better do this just so you guys can uh, appreciate it. Gigantopithecus, known for its tibula, of course. Um, look, this is actually the picture that Ramat ripped. Like, <laughs> this is the one. You think there are some better ones I think that he could have gone with. I like this one personally. Can you guys see this? Let me see. Now you can kind of see it. I don't know. I like the, it looks like they're a, a newly wedded couple. I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Very romantic. Um, Gigantopithecus is just a, it's a big hominid, right? I mean, it's got these, it's got megadonti, huge molars, lived in, uh, the, in Southeast Asia during the Miocene, um, or beginning in the Miocene, I believe. Uh, I, th I think that's when they started diversifying. No, nope, Middle Pleistocene. Middle Pleistocene, rather. I'm like way off on that one. I apologize. I've got Miocene apes on the brain. I'm currently reading through this bad boy right here. An apes view of human evolution. It's mostly concerns Miocene apes, and a lot of those guys are from the Miocene. <laughs> but uh, a Gigantopithecus is known mostly from its its massive molars. I mean, it's got huge primate molars, so it's definitely an organism. And it certainly wasn't in 19 the 1950s that this was like what overturned? I mean, in 1956, first, the first mandible and over a thousand teeth were found. Numerous remains have been found since then in at least 16 sites. Uh, teeth and mandibles are the only bits that we actually have from it. But like, wow, like how do you get that this wrong? You know, I mean, I don't, I'm not even seeing anything here about people like being mad that Gigantopithecus isn't a thing. <laughs> so, I mean, you can take that as you will. Like you, you can you see what I mean? This feels like a this feels like a raw man portion. If I may be so bold. <laughs> so and then, God, like, can we appreciate too that this is about missing links and they're talking about just just a regular old hominid? Like this would be like, this would be like getting upset about you know early, like Cebopithecus, right? Like oh my God, like we're overturning Cebopithecus, an ancestor of an orangutan. It doesn't have anything to do with human evolution. So. Okay. All right. Ramapithecus, found to be the ancestor of an orangutan in 1979. Fail. Well, thank you, Ramat. Let's appreciate Ramapithecus for a moment. Let's see. <laughs> Ramapithecus, because I believe that this was, yeah, that's what I was just going to say. We were just talking. I was going to say Ramapithecus was what we were just discussing. It's it's the former name of Sivapithecus, who is considered to be um, an orang relative. So Sivapithecus, very cool animal, but to my knowledge, never attributed to be like a human, right? Some early discoveries were given the separate name Ramapithecus and Bramapithecus and were thought to be possible ancestors of humans. So this would have been back in the 19th century, when, when specifically, 1910, right? So this is prior to the discovery of, of the Australopithecines. Um, I think it's quite fair that people would have been like, well, maybe. I mean, this thing did orangutans have slightly more um, rounded facial features. They look almost a little bit more hominin-like than some of the chimps that have these you know, highly prognathic faces, um, and much more jetted forward than, than the flatter, more bowl shape that we see in um, in some members of Pongo and uh, relatives of Pongo. So, okay, <laughs> just a, yet another one that, you know, I mean... I suppose if you if you really want to say that back in 1910 this was considered a potential human ancestor, that it was like a, a fail, <laughs> you can have that one, Ramat. We'll let you have that one. Next one, <laughs> Narikotomi boy, aka Turkana boy, dated to 1.5 to 1.6 million years ago, sold as a missing link related to Homo ergaster. Fail was found to be no different from modern man. I just, I put another, I put another big fat nope right there found for, for that found to be no different than, uh, than modern man. Because that, that's, could not be further from the truth. Let me show you what I mean here. Hold on. <laughs> Gotta get out of here. All right. Turkana boy. So, this specimen is, like, generously given to Homo ergaster. People sometimes give it to Homo erectus. Like, some people think that Homo erectus is going to be your, your better move. But the main reason, at least, that I was taught that this guy is considered to be um, potentially not 
fully into that homo erectus group, which again, kind of depends on if you're a lumper or a splutter here, is because of its brain case size. Several def significant defining characters, such as a bigger brain size of 880 cc's. So that's big for the time period that this guy's being found, that these organisms are living. But anatomically modern humans have 1,200 to 1,400 cc brain cases. Uh, this is not that. This is like not even close to that. <laughs> very, very far removed. Now you could make the argument to a degree that because this is a, you know, a juvenile, if memory serves, um, that that's the reason, but you're not going to be, you're not going to be covering, you know, over 400, 400 to 600 <laughs> cc's of brain case in between that, in between that growth period. That is not at all anything close to what we've ever seen. Um, 11 to 12 years based off of bone maturity. So I'm imagining they're probably doing like epiphyseal plate stuff uh, and dental dating could potentially skew that younger. But Turkana boy or Nariokotomi boy like definitively isn't human. <laughs> the, the idea that he even puts was found to be no different from modern man with just, just no elaboration. Like it's just walks into a room Turkana boy is just a human, walks out without elaboration. That's the kind of meme that we're seeing here. Other than just the brain case size, we're seeing some serious differences in other general morphology. Um, and they kind of go through it here. Like, obviously it's a biped. We're seeing bipedal adaptations emerging. I mean, depending on who you talk to as early as Ardipithecus rabidus, 4.4 million years ago. But even then, we've got this large sloping forehead, very strong brow ridges or supraorbital ridges, uh, and no chin, which is, again, a classic for Homo sapiens, as I've mentioned here before. There's significant defining of characters, such as the uh, bigger brain size, but again, very small for anatomically modern humans. Like, I don't think humans range even, modern humans certainly don't, but even archaic even Heidelbergensis, I don't think, reaches into that area. The arms and legs are slightly longer, longer, indicating effective bipedality. The nose is projecting like those of humans, rather than seeing the flat, just clipped on sweat gland by accident, flat open nose seen in uh, other apes. Body hair may have been thinner, most likely naked, possibility of increased sweat glands to increase, co or to hasten cooling. Skin was probably darker with abundant melanin, it was an equatorial species. Um, but, I mean, we're looking at Facial morphology. Let's see if we can get a skull here. Skull. There it is. Okay. You're gonna look at this and you're gonna tell me this is an anatomically modern human. I mean, as as mentioned, Lou, you've got the retromolar gap back here. You've got uh, while you do have a nasal bone, you're looking at definitive prognathism compared to an anatomically modern human. Um, the brain case is much smaller and it's not nearly as globular as what we see in anatomically modern humans. Um, the dentition seems to project forward more than what we see in uh, anatomically modern homo sapiens. Um, the ramus looks thicker too. Let's see. Um, human skull profile. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so thicker ramus. Obviously, there's that lack of a chin right there. I mean, that's not, as a raw mat would like to put it, that's not a reduced chin. That is simply no chin, like at all. Um, it actually doesn't really look like we ever read. I mean, maybe a slight retromolar gap. But typically, retromolar gaps are going to be like a Neanderthal trait. Well, I don't know. I guess it depends on the angle that you look at it. This looks like we've got a much larger retromolar gap. Um, bottom line, it's not human. <laughs> it's not anatomically modern human. And you know, the thing that's kind of funny about this is if you actually map out the range for like Australopithecus africanus, right? Africanus africanus, depending on who you talk to, how you pronounce it, uh, whose maximum brain case size is like 550 cc's, and then the minimum for humans is typically around 1200 cc's, Turconoboy is like right in the middle. It's it's 10 cc's closer to, to modern humans than it is to Australopithecines. So to say that this is just a human is so beyond silly, I don't even know what to say. Um, which, of course, brings us back to the book, <laughs> where we discuss another classic, Homo floresiensis, also known as the Hobbit, yet another epic fail. They peddled this so-called human ancestor as a missing link transitional. No, they didn't. 
<laughs> it was never, to my knowledge, Homo floresiensis, the, the hobbit from Flores, was never once peddled as a transitional species, just a variant of, of modern genus, modern genus homo, of uh, late genus homo. So uh, what, would it, what would the transition be, right? I mean, Homo floresiensis is like smaller than, than some of our Australopithecines. So how would it how would it act as a transitional species exactly? But I digress. We've beaten this horse to death. Um, but let's let Robat continue, and we'll we'll touch on it again because apparently we need to touch on it seven or eight times before this you know gets through. It's like ramming a round peg through a square hole. We've covered this so-called human ancestor in detail throughout this book. The hobbits were nothing but pygmy humans that suffered from reductive evolution. This was also due to isolation and inbreeding. Body proportions, totally human, just stunted. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then we have the epic live science picture uh, screen grab that can no longer be found online because it's so outdated. I mean, we let's let's check this out. Live science, Homo floresiensis. Now I think it's kind of funny. We'll pick the oldest one that we can find, which is 2016, as far as I am aware. Uh, and it's still this one is still vastly different from what's presented in this book. And you want to know how I know that? Because we've been over this before with with these same people. We've been over this before like multiple times. The Life Science article that Ramat links says, the surprising discovery of bones heralded as a new hobbit-like human species may turn out to have simply been the remains of a human suffering from a genetic illness that caused the body and brain to shrink, according to researchers challenging the original report. Now, naturally, most of this is cut off, but let's appreciate what, what 2016 Live Science, 2016, you know, five years ago, half a decade ago, science has to say about Homo floresiensis. It's an ancient hominin. It was discovered in 2003. Um, LB1 is, is the brain, or the brain, um, the, the skull that's typically referred to. Got the nickname the Hobbit because it's so small. Um, fits into the family tree of hominins. How it fits into the family tree of hominins is unclear. Uh, some people think that it's a squat offshoot of Homo erectus, but it's quite funny because this is a 2016 life science article. And if we move on to some of our later uh, live science articles will find that it's actually been determined to not be um, parsimonious with Homo erectus uh, ancestry, probably coming from a pre-Homo erectus hominin, like Homo habilis, for example. More recent, it, actually, you don't even have to go. More recent arguments suggest the hobbit species may have evolved from a pre-Homo erectus hominin. You don't even have to actually move backwards from that. But let's continue. We don't need what it looks like. What else do we know? Uh, we don't need that one. Here we go. Was Homo floresiensis a separate species? Critics have argued that the specimen belonged to an extinct human with microcephalia, a pathological condition characterized by a small head. The hobbit is estimated to have a brain about one third the size of modern humans, about chimp size, actually. Uh, short stature and intellectual disabilities. They figured out if it was really a modern human, they created endocast, etc., etc. A team concluded in 2007 that the hobbit's features were closer to a typical modern human than a microcephalic person, suggesting they don't have microcephalia. A study published in 2013 revealed it had a larger brain than once thought. That's more than one-third the size of a modern human brain. And the findings suggested Homo erectus may be an ancestor, as uh, Javanese specimens of Homo erectus had smaller brains, but more recently, um, more pathological, let's see, used a different pathological argument to suggest it was not a distinct species in 2014. But then in a PNAS letter responding to the paper, Collard and his colleagues refuted the claim, arguing Homo floresiensis lacks the jaw structure, specifically the chin, that's the defining characteristic of Homo sapiens. So, let's see, a study published in July 22nd, Collard continued to compile a data set containing 380 skull and dental features from 20 known hominin species. That's an enormous sample size. After analyzing and comparing the features using different statistical methods, they concluded Homo floresiensis was indeed a distinct species and not just a small-bodied or deformed human. What's more, the analysis suggests the hobbit is a descendant of pre-erectus, pre-homo erectus, small-bodied hominin, um, implying Homo erectus may not have been the first hominin to leave. So, like, literally what I've said dozens upon dozens of times on this channel, j just saying the same thing that has been BTFO'd by, like, the largest analysis that's been done. Uh, this was done in July 27th, 2016. And we're... <laughs> 
we're, we're seriously beating the horses, you know, not just to death, but we're like speeding up decomposition with the, you know, rapid frequency at which we're smacking this thing. But, you know, some people never learn. Okay. Oh, oh, well, what I was going to say uh, about this, this life science thing, again, you can't find it. This is the oldest life science that you can find about Homo floresiensis, I'm assuming, without using the Wayback Machine, but I don't really know how to use the Wayback Machine, so I actually haven't searched on the Wayback Machine. But you can find, let's see if, we can, if it'll show up, I probably won't show up here, because it's actually so out of date. <laughs> um, yeah, you can't. You're, you're not going to find anything that's suggesting that, that Homo floresiensis was, was a deformed human. Like, that's just not supported by any of the data. So, cross that. But it also wasn't considered a transitional species in the first place, not between something more basal and anatomically modern humans. Next up, Homo pongoides. Primatologist John Napier found it to be nothing but a latex model. Homo pongoides, I don't know where he's actually getting that name from, but I wrote never considered a hominid because I know what latex, um, what latex model they're talking about. And the reason John Napier like went and investigated it is because Napier, along with some other primatologists of the late 1900s, were very sympathetic to the Bigfoot claims of the North American hominid hypothesis. And um, like as a result, this thing was being peddled not as a human relative or a, a human ancestor, I suppose you should say but as a Bigfoot. So no, he was never considered a hominin. He was never proposed to be a hominin. Uh, but thank you, Ramat, for continuing to reduce my faith that you know what you're talking about. Okay, next up, Eoanthropus Dawsoni, AKA Piltdown Man, was sold to the public again as a missing link ancestor. Bone fragments were presented as the fossilized human remains of a previously unknown early human. In 2016, the results of an extensive scientific review established that amateur archeologist Charles Dawson had very likely perpetrated a hoax. I, I can't... I can't believe that he's written this down here. He's got... Bone fragments were presented as the fossil remains of a previously unknown human in 2016. The results of an extensive scientific research established the amateur archaeologist Charles Dawson was very likely perpetrating a hoax. And then he's got the Wikipedia article that discusses how the hoax was demonstrated in 1953. I really need you to see this because I forgot this. I actually must have missed him goofing this the first time because I, I didn't make any notes on it. But like, like he, he talks about Piltdown being a hoax and how it was like found out in 2016. But Piltdown was known to be a hoax since like way before that. <laughs> like that's common knowledge. Uh, this has been talked about for, for ages, decades. And the... The thing, the weird thing I don't think many people appreciate about Piltdown Man is that Piltdown Man was actually a huge blessing in disguise for anthropology because the fact that this hoax was perpetrated in the first place and initially accepted means that when it was eventually shown to be fraudulent, every single existing fossil and then every subsequent fossil that has been found since then has been analyzed with such intense scrutiny to prevent any kind of hoaxing from occurring again. Everyone gets to put their eyes on anything. And you have the utmost motivation, if you're not the one who found it, to show that they're, you know, the person who found this new hominin is, is, is full of crap. Um, so, blessing in disguise, but yes, Piltdown Man is like the only actual anthropological hoax that has ever been perpetrated. And again, it was discovered to be a hoax by anthropologists. So, great. Wow, a huge win. Next, he has Anamensis. Studies of the microware on Australopithecus anamensis molar fragments show a pattern of long striations. This pattern is similar to the microware on the molars of, of gorillas, suggesting Australopithecus anamensis had a diet similar to that of the modern gorilla. The microware patterns are consistent on all Australopithecus anamensis molar fragments, molar fossils, regardless of location or time. Why believe it is anything other than a gorilla? <laughs> Yet they do. This species is 4 million years old and an ancestor to A. afarensis, another ape pushed as a human ancestor, fraud. I mean, like, you can't make this stuff up. The argument that's being presented here is the molars of Australopithecus anamensis show microware patterns that look very similar to those of, of foliverous gorillas, modern foliverous gorillas. And that's being used to suggest that actually Australopithecus anamensis is a gorilla. 
Now, there are a couple of problems with that. One, the molars are unique from gorillas. There's a reason why Romat doesn't actually discuss the morphology of the molars. Gorilla molars are different than Australopithecus anamensis molars. They are different in size, they're different in, uh, to some degree, the, the heights of certain cusps. And it blows my mind that the microware is being proposed here because gorillas, yes, they are modern folivores, but when they have fruits available, they consume fruit. So essentially their folivory is, is used as kind of like a fallback food. And Australopithecines are thought to be very similar in that fashion. They all prefer fruit because it's, it's high in sugar, highly beneficial for any kind of organism that, that can actually digest it because they're, they're higher in energy content, right? Um, you can eat like one fruit and that equates to, you know, two or three hours of eating grass. So that's what's going to be the preferred substance. But fruits aren't as hardy as grasses are, which means when there's a, a massive climatic change, a climatic shift, the grasses are going to be the fallback food for many different species, which is why a lot of Australopithecines show striations of filivory, right? Like they show indications of filivory. What he doesn't talk about is that they also show diets that lend themselves to frugivory. And later on in, in certain other hominins, um, they show pitting, which means they're, they're consuming harder foodstuffs, right? With, with, with pits and cores and things like nuts, seeds, and, and pitted fruits. So. Like, you're just leaving out an entire thing and being like, well, it has this thing in common with gorillas, so, like, why don't we just say it's a gorilla? It, that's insane to me. But moreover, <laughs> Australopithecus anamensis. Ooh, I suppose we should put fossil. Yeah, so we have Australopithecus anamensis remains that are like entirely distinct from gorillas. So this is Australopithecus anamensis. This is the anamensis skull that we have. And this is the skull of a gorilla. I'm really sorry, but you aren't going to get anywhere if you're trying to propose that this is the same thing as this. What? Where's the sagittal crest? Where are the massive canines? Like, th that's the thing that gets me the most, is like, my, you know, my thesis was on uh, sexual dimorphism of, of canine teeth in primates, right? All extants. And while male canine teeth in gorillas are going to be larger than females, females still have big ass canine teeth. And these guys do not have those. They don't have the roots for them, and they don't have any of the, of the large canines that are attributed to them either. And that's because they, they, they couldn't house them. That wasn't the nature of their palate. That isn't the nature of their palate. Like th this is so insane to me. This would be like, this would be like finding a, a Tyrannosaurus Rex skull, right? And looking at the Tyrannosaurus Rex skull and examining the teeth and being like, well, you know, the microwear patterns on this on these teeth suggest that it had a a very similar diet to modern alligators and crocodiles, modern crocodilians. Uh, so it must just be a crocodile. It's like, no, the skulls are drastically different. They couldn't be more different. They couldn't be more clearly two separate animals, a crocodile versus a Tyrannosaurus rex. Sharing diet does not mean that they're the same thing, and I can't believe that I'm actually having to spend time talking about why. So let's move on. <laughs> Next up, oh goodness, Paranthropus robustus. Regarding cranial features, proved to be Regarding cranial features, proved to be in the direction of a heavy chewing complex. I have no idea. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, this is just a badly constructed sentence. Regarding cranial features, it, meaning Paranthropus robustus, proved to be in the direction of heavy chewing complex. Yes, that's 100% true. The Paranthropines, uh, sometimes colloquially referred to as like nutcracker men, have these huge meganaut molars uh, for grinding, and they probably spent a lot of their day chewing based off of that. It had large jaws and jaw muscles and head shape, head shape like a gorilla's. Its sagittal crest is nowhere nearly as impressive as a gorilla's, and its face is nowhere nearly as prognathic as a gorilla's. I'll show you that in a second. The sagittal crest that runs from the top of the skull acts as an anchor for large chewing muscles. That's true. Paranthropus robustus males may have only stood 4 feet tall and weighed 120 pounds, while females stood under 1 meter, 3 feet 2 inches tall, and weighed only 90 pounds. There was a great deal of skepticism and criticism from the academic community. Nothing about this is human, just another ape fraud pushed on us. The mandibular ramus morphology on recent tests closely matches that of a gorilla fraud. I, 
like I don't you can't make this up like this is just what's written on the page and it you know I mean it sounds like it sounds like something that like a fifth grader would write after their trip to the creation museum um it's it's poorly constructed both in sentence structure and in like information content so uh, let's talk about this too so paranthropines were never proposed to be like human ancestors at least not that i am aware of the paranthropines are considered to be a sister group and, and have been for like decades and decades and decades now paranthropus robustus paranthropus robustus we have the skulls from these guys and paranthropus robustus's skull is again this is not a gorilla right like I, I hope you can appreciate that despite the fact that it has a small sagittal crest, that can be viewed much easier from this side right like that, um, it's, it's face is bowl-ish. It's like bullish and flat. It's much more similar to an orangutan's than a gorilla's. And the teeth, the molars are actually, if memory serves, quite a bit larger than what we see in gorillas. Uh, these guys were, were the, the, the classic chewers. I mean, I, I should clarify, accounting for body size. These guys were the chewers of the animal kingdom uh, at the time. But I mean, golly, I, I'm like stroking out just imagining how one could, could propose that this is a gorilla. And no one ever proposed that it was an ancestor of Homo sapiens. This has always been considered to be a sister group. So let's move on with that. Oh, St. Helenthus Chidensis, aka Tomai. Um, he put Tomia. I, I'm not surprised, I'm just disappointed. Presented as a missing link that gave rise to the Lucy species is just an extinct species of primate. Some, even in the secular world, are skeptical that Sailorinthus chidensis can be defined as a hominin rather than some other form of ape. Yet this hasn't stopped atheist evolutionists from saying it's related to Aurorin, who they only have 20 small fragments of broken bones of and none of the skull. Yet Sailorinthus chidensis uh, itself has no postcranial remains, bones below the skull. None have ever been discovered, yet evolutionists claim it was bipedal anyways. What a joke. Another fraud to add to the list. The reason that Sailorinthus chidensis has been proposed to be bipedal by some is because of the location of the position of the frame and magnum. That's the hole at the base of the skull. This is another thing that we've talked about, like, to death. Now, a recent paper by uh, Machiarelli, I believe Machiarelli et al., claims that uh, a potentially associated femur suggests that Sailorinthus chidensis was not, in fact, bipedal. Guy et al., the original discoverers of Sailorinthus chidensis, though, actually push against this because they don't think that that femur is necessarily associated with Sahelanthropus chidensis, and they argue that if Sahelanthropus chidensis was indeed uh, some kind of quadruped or knuckle walker, it wouldn't be able to actually hold its head right um, because of those that location of the foramen and magnum. So if we're just going based off of the skull, the only thing that we can definitively attribute to Sahelanthropus chidensis, it has to be a biped or else it's going to be craning its neck all the time to look up, right? Because the way that the foramen and magnum works, hold that thought, the way that the foramen magnum works, the hole at the base of the skull, is that it sits on top of your vertebral column like that. And that's how we hold our heads upright, because our heads are on top of our vertebral columns. In the case of a chimpanzee, which I have right here, the foramen magnum is located much further to the back. You see? That hole to the back allows it to move around quadrupedally, um, although albeit angled more bipedally. It's kind of in between a quadruped and a biped. Um, location of the foramen magnum here versus the location of the foramen magnum on a human. These things are located in different positions. It's very clear. Sailanthropus chidensis is foramen magnum is much closer to that of a human than that of a chimp, which is why we know that the owner of that skull, at least, was probably a biped. I'm probably going to use these again, so I'm just going to set them down. <laughs> um, and I'm probably going to use a Oshelgivkis afrensis as well, which you can see has a frame and magnum at the base of the skull. We're holding its head upright on top of the vertebral column. And that's how we know that the australopithecines were bipedal while we're at it. Although I'm sure we're gonna be talking about that again very soon. Let's continue. Okay. Um, Oreopithecus bambolii. I'm gonna stop right there. This is a Miocene ape. Oreopithecus has never been proposed like with any kind of confidence as a definitive human ancestor. That's, that's just not happened. Let me show you what Oreopithecus looks like. Oreopithecus bambolii. Cool, cool primate. Very cool. Um, nothing to suggest that it was necessarily a human ancestor. Like, even if we could show that this thing was a biped, um, 
It's a Miocene ape, and that could have quite easily convergently evolved. The pelvis certainly suggests that it wasn't a biped, but that's my thing. So with the knowledge that no one proposes this is a definitive human ancestor, let's let Romat um, do his spiel. In the 1950s, Swiss paleontologist Johannes uh, Herzeller, Herzeller, Hutzeller, discovered a complete skeleton in Bassanello and claimed it was a true hominin based on its short jaw, reduced canines, and claimed that it was also a biped. Short jaws and reduced canines are characteristic of a uh, hominin, but potentially it could also just be indicative of a reduction in sexual dimorphism due to a potential reduction in group size, which maybe owes itself to climatic change. Sold to the public as an intermediary again until the 1990s when new analysis research of Oreopithecus was directly related to Dryopithecus, a genus of extinct apes. What can I say except no one said it was like definitively going to be a hominin. It's, its founder like asserted it could be a hominin. But again, what I'm saying and what I've said prior is definitive. Like, it's not being asserted with the confidence that like Artipithecus rabidus is or uh, any of the Australopithecines. Homo heidelbergensis. Bone structure and number all identical to humans today, yet sold to us an intermediary, not even close, total human and lived alongside Neanderthals and Denisovans. Uh, I put, oh, please, because then he put uh, a picture of, like, a boxer with, like, a kind of pointy-ish head as a way to be like, look, this is this phenotypic variation. Um, no. <laughs> Homo heidelbergensis also has distinct morphology to those of anatomically modern humans. Homo heidelbergensis. I really do love that we're doing this completely out of order, though. <laughs> Why are we talking about Homo heidelbergensis now, and then we're going to talk about, like, Homo habilis right after? Amazing. Amazing! This is Homo heidelbergensis right here. Do those look like the superorbital ridges of an anatomically modern human? The answer is no. <laughs> it has a nice brain case size, uh, and it's certainly very close to anatomically modern humans when compared to some of our other hominins, but as far as being a hominin with any kind of certainty, or being a hominin, being a human, anatomically modern human with any certainty, um, we can say boldly that no, this is not a human, an anatomically modern human. This is its own unique species. Look at the size of this retromolar gap right here. Now that's what I'm talking about. So, Omaha to let's see. Brain case size. I think it's like 1100 or something like that. You know what, I bet we could just go to Google. This is, you know what, I, sometimes, sometimes I wonder if I'm not undergoing <laughs> severe genetic entropy when I'm trying to do this kind of thing and navigate modern technology, you know? Born in the wrong generation. I should have been born in the Miocene. Okay, 1220. So we do have an overlap with uh, humans. Um, PBS notes, it's large from erectus, but small from a sapiens, uh, and the face is large with a particularly wide upper mandible. So the brain case, I mean, yeah, that's a that's a good sized brain case. I would argue though that you're not going to be using brain case size alone to define a species. That's never been the only the only factor. Um, and even if it was, these guys consistently map to the lower end, which would give them a different range than Homo sapiens. Um, so even if you did use brain case size, it would still be distinct. But morphology, morphologically, I should say, um, the facial, facial structure, facial morphology, etc. It's got unique aspects that you're just not going to see in anatomically modern humans. More human-like face, nasal opening is set completely vertically. Um, yeah, completely vertically in the skull. Interior nasal sill can be crested uh, or with a prominent spine. We have frontal bone that's broad, parietal bone that can be expanded. Um, let's see here. Average the brain volumes of 30 Homo erectus or ergaster species, showing a significant jump from Homo ergaster, Homo erectus to Homo heidelbergensis. Potentially notable sexual dimorphism, with males being significantly larger than females. And the build is going to be relatively similar as well. But that being said, we're still seeing diagnostic traits right here. So these would be the traits that would show where it differs from anatomically modern Homo sapiens. Um, reduced chin, notch in the submental space that's near the throat, parallel upper and lower boundaries of the mandible and side view, um, upper and lower boundaries of the mandible, several mental foramina, which are holes for blood vessels near the cheek teeth, um, there's the horizontal retromolar space, that's your retromolar gap right there, 
uh, gutter between the molars and the ramus. That's the jaw of this or the body um, angle of the skull. Um, exclusive planum alveolar, alveolar, which is the distance between the frontmost tooth socket to the back of the jaw. Okay, and the developed planum triangulare, triangulare. I guess you would say near the jaw hinge. Oops. Those are your diagnostic traits for Homo heidelbergensis. So again. <laughs> You're not dealing with an anatomically modern human. And I don't think that you could make that case just from, even if you're a layman, just glancing at it. But of course, eyeballing it is how these guys do it, so I don't know. I don't know. All right, fraud, not a missing link. Oh, okay, this is going to be, the frame and magnum and orbital tilt all match modern humans. Yes, it's a biped. Y yes, absolutely. Of course the frame and magnum would match anatomically modern humans. But that's not the only diagnostic trait that we use. Again, see all the stuff that I just read and stumbled over because I've had too much caffeine today. Okay, I had to switch out the coffee for some tea because uh, I started to get a sore throat from doing all this enraged speaking. Our next one on the list I already got set up because uh, it's just raw Matt being mad that there's another Australopithecine. Now, this particular Australopithecine, Australopithecus derimida, Diarbida. I don't really know this one very well because usually it's attributed to Australopithecus afarensis. He incorrectly says that it's just Paranthropus. Um, not like Paranthropus robustus or Paranthropus boisei or, you know, Paranthropus blackii. None of that. Uh, or blackii. I can't believe I said that. Boisei, robustus, or um, Aethiopicus. My mistake. Blackii. That's Gigantopithecus. Um, just Paranthropus, though. <laughs> he just says it's uh, Paranthropus in blue there it is yeah. just parenthesis again nothing but three jaws were found and some other broken fragments this ape species is similar to lucy but slightly different nothing but another species of ape i mean you're an ape on that so i mean technically yeah r slash technically correct <laughs> even though it is proposed species of early hominin on wikipedia and in books this social the scene isn't really mentioned in like textbooks that i've seen but um you know Australopithecus Afer afarensis is, and Anamensis and Africanus. Uh, so, I don't know. I, I would just propose that it's probably a variant of those species, but I'm also not an Australopithecine ex expert, so clip that out one if you want. Uh, clip that one out if you want. <laughs> so, um, then we move on to Aurora and Tugenensis. <sighs> this one really gets my goat, because Aurora and Tugenensis, we don't have a skull for it. In fact, the main feature of Aurora and Tugenensis is actually the femoral head. And that's how we know it's a biped, <laughs> because again, it's very similar to the, the, the skull. Biomechanically, it lends itself to bipedality much more than, than quadrupedalism. And that's because the angle uh, is, is diagonal. It's much more similar to what we see in humans so that the weight can be held directly underneath the body rather than spread out on all four limbs. But that doesn't stop Ramat from saying debate, debate over the thigh bone, he means femur, between scientists who say it is proof of bipedalism, another joke in the long line of frauds. Like, imagine being like, yeah, scientists are arguing about a subject, so it's a fraud. <laughs> okay? Um, also, I don't think that there's very many anthropologists out there who think that Aurora Tugenensis wasn't a biped, for the record. Uh, Aurora is related to modern humans to this day. Nothing more has ever been found, yet it is stated on wiki... Aurora proves to be direct human ancestor. What a shock. Just kidding. Fraud. If that sounds like I was, like, having an embolism just then, that's because that's how this is written. As if the author was also having an embolism or stroking out. Um, so for posterity, so that you too can see how it's written, um, it, it, it's just incoherent. Aurora is related to modern humans to this day. That's the first sentence, followed by, nothing more has ever been found. Yet it is stated on wiki, I guess he means Wikipedia, Aurora proves to be directed human ancestor. What a shock, just kidding, fraud. I mean, you can be mad about it, but nothing that you've written in this book has done anything to actually tackle the hominins that you're claiming are frauds. You're just saying that they're frauds, or like that they have things in common with other apes, and then leaving out all the things that they have in common with modern humans. That's fine, but... It certainly doesn't make it a good argument. Oh boy. Okay, so next up is Homo habilis. This is this is going to be a big one. Let me see what we've got going on. I think I think eventually we're going to get to Lucy. That's going to be a big one too. 
Sadiba is going to be a bit. There's just a lot more to get through in this appendix. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to split this into two parts. But I think covering Homo habilis is probably going to be good for this. We're going to cover Homo habilis, and then we're going to leave the next hominin, Box Grove Man, uh, through Lucy Australopithecus sacrensis, uh, through Australopithecus sediba, and ending with, who do we end with? Denisovans? Or Neanderthalensis? Yeah, it looks like we're ending with Neanderthalensis. Um, and we'll do that in the next video. Um, so allow me to take a sip of my tea while I set up our Homo habilis stuff, because there's like a paragraph on it, and it's like, you know how they say, you know, the saying goes, like there's more things wrong with the sentence than there are words in the sentence? Th this one challenges that. Like there may actually be more wrong in the sentence than there are like syllables in the sentence. So you'll, you'll see what I mean in a moment. Okay. Let's do this. Homo habilis. He puts Homo habilis equals Paranthropus boisei, a smorgasbord, smorgasbord is in bold, of random miscellaneous fossil finds all tossed in the same bin. When skeletons are found a little more complete, they are completely ape in every way. Paleontologist Bernard Wood and professor of biological anthropology, it, he means anthropology, what he put was professor of biological anthropologist, C. Loring Brace from the University of Michigan were arguing Homo habilis was an invalid taxon and then determined that d determined the Homo habilis was pure ape. It's another fraud push today as one of their best examples of missing link intermediaries. Feel free to email them anytime and ask for the truth. And then he puts a, he puts a hyperlink <laughs> so that I guess that while you're reading, you can click it and shoot them an email. Um, after this, he moves on to Box Grove Man. So in this simple paragraph, we've gotten so much wrong, it's crazy. And I think that we need to address it piece by piece, as, as one should do. Now, first and foremost, let's discuss very briefly what Bernard Wood and, uh, and, and Loring Brace of the University of Michigan were, were discussing, because I've already touched on this in past videos, gone over that specific example. And essentially what they're saying is that early genus Homo is something of a mess. There are a lot of, of very basal traits and derived traits that are getting intermingled due to the mosaic nature of genus Homo emerging, because genus Homo's emergence is like, it's like a human connotation, right? The gradient of life doesn't really care about our, our taxonomic categorizations. But hmm, what their point wasn't is that Homo habilis is not a real organism, right? They were just saying that the specimens of Homo habilis necessarily don't need to be in Homo habilis. Some of them might be Australopithecines from their perspective, and some of them might be early genus Homo. But keep in mind, that is not the, the widely held opinion. Bernard Wood doesn't think that Homo habilis isn't, like, isn't a species. It doesn't, he doesn't think that the specimens are fake or anything like that. He just thinks that there's more of a gradient than, than is typically appreciated. A problem that can be solved, by the way, if we divide Homo habilis out into different species, which is what some people think needs to be done. Some individuals think that Homo habilis is actually several different species of Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, and Homo gautengensis. Typically, rudolfensis is accepted by most, but gautengensis is very iffy. But, <laughs> this is the biggie, uh, this whole idea of a wastebasket taxon and, like, random fossils being thrown into Homo habilis, um, first of all, that's not true, but second of all, it doesn't matter, because we have a lot of skulls, and the skulls are, in my opinion, what show so blatantly their intermediate status. Let me show you what I mean. <laughs> so, this picture that we've got right here in the background is OH24. Now, OH24 is like a mostly complete skull, as you can see. Um, it's got some mild prognathism, decent zygomatics. It's got a small-ish brain case size, um, and it's not the only skull that we have. We also have KNM ER1470. This individual is additionally thought to be um, a, a very early member of genus Homo. Some people would attribute this to a Homo rudolfensis, which comes a bit later, has a bit larger of a brain case size. You can see it's got a much more globular skull um, and, and a more flat face than our OH24, which is a bit more prognathic and has uh, less, more of a sloping forehead than, you know, kind of a vaulted one. Um, and then you've got uh, KNM ER1813, which 
is somewhat intermediate to the two. Um, all of these are found relatively close to one another, um, to one another um, uh, geologically speaking. And they all show variation within their brain case sizes, but they generally fit within the range of about 650 to 750, maybe 800 if you really want to push it. Uh, and depending on who you include. Because we also have uh, Homo gantangensis over here. Um, very fragmentary remains from, from this skull. Uh, but fortunately, we have most of one side, and so you can actually mirror image it over, because we are, of course, bilaterally symmetrical. And you can get what's you know a decently com complete idea of what this, what this skull probably looked like. And that's why so many people attribute it to Homo habilis, because it looks quite similar to those that we uh, confidently attribute to Homo habilis, like uh, OH24 and KNM ER1813. Hmm. There's a really nice picture here that shows early variation in genus Homo. Early variation in genus Homo. Let's see if we can't show you guys here, because I think you'll appreciate this. Um, yeah, here. But this, it's not labeled. This one's labeled. Ah, okay, here it is. Can you guys see that okay? Let me jump over to... No. Oh, yeah, yes, you can. Okay, so the diversity of species near the origin of genus Homo. So both of these to the left are members of like Homo habilis or Homo rudolfensis, and to the right are members of Homo erectus. Now, if you really wanted to get into the weeds, um, the, the, the splitters would say that we're seeing Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis to the left. I believe that's Homo rudolfensis in 1813. Um, let me see here. 1470. Yes. So you would get the argument that we're seeing Homo rudolfensis and then Homo habilis there on the left, and then on the right, some would propose that you're seeing uh, Homo georgicus and either Homo erectus or Homo ergaster. Um, and the lumpers would say that it's Homo habilis on the left and it's Homo erectus on the right, and there's just a lot of variation within species. Naming species doesn't ultimately matter, biologically speaking. Like I said, life is a gradient. This can be appreciated by, by anyone who's you know in biology or adjacent to it. Uh, but I am of the opinion that species can be helpful for understanding um, kind of the, the, the gradient that we are visualizing here. Um, so I think it would be more than fair to say, okay, well, there is quite a bit of variation between um, you know the, the Havilands over there on the left, the one that looks more like um, kind of humanish with that vaulted forehead, Homo rudolfensis, we can just go ahead and call it that, and Homo habilis on the right. And then over when you move over to the uh, Homo erectus members, you could potentially separate those out too. The Dimnesi specimens are super, super small brained, for instance. I mean, the, these guys are like overlapping with with um, uh, some like big brained australopithecines, potentially. So that's the messy nature of human evolution. But then you get into the weeds that is, uh, Mm. the fact that these skulls are complete and they show mosaic uh, uh, features between the more basal, more ape-like australopithecines and the more modern genus Homo. You can't have a skull that's a waste basket, which is the argument that Ron Matt's making, is that Homo habilis is made up and that it's a mix of australopithecus bones and human bones, and that's why they look like such perfect transitional species. The problem with that is these are skulls, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they can't be mixed together. It's two bones. It's a skull and a crania and a mandible. Um, so you're going to have a really, really hard time making that one float, which is why most creationists uh, just ignore the members of Homo habilis, uh, potential species of Homo habilis entirely. And most will also enjoy, uh, enjoy it. Most will also uh, ignore Australopithecus sediba because Australopithecus sediba is very, very similar to early members of Homo habilis. Um, particularly, I believe, OH24. Yeah, with that sloping forehead. And um, that postcrania is probably very indicative of what we're seeing with Homo habilis as well. The, the postcrania that we see in MH1 and MH2, the members of Australopithecus sediba. So, well, let me show you. Well, we'll, we'll get to Australopithecus sediba in a bit. So, <laughs> it, it's not a wastebasket taxon because we got one, two, three, four, potentially add a few more given we've got fragmentary skulls that are very similar to all of these. Um, and I think you're going to have a very difficult time saying that, that you were looking at a mixed bone bag here. They're skulls. And as you'll see when we get to Australopithecus sediba, sometimes it's not just that they're skulls, but it's that they're skulls and we also have with that 
bones that are in articulation. So a humerus that is in the dirt, in the you know, cemented and mineralized in the ground, still attached to the shoulder, like the scapula. Um, those would be our articulated specimens. So we got them both. <laughs> Very, I have yet to hear an actual, you know, rebuttal, I guess, to this whole, you can't have a wastebasket taxon when we're dealing with skulls. Like it can't be a fake species if we're dealing with skulls, which is exactly why Bernard's, Bernard Wood's uh, stance is being misrepresented in this text. He's not saying that they're not real specimens. He's arguing that Homo habilis is, is having too many species thrown into it and perhaps, you know, uh, splitting it up is a good idea. Uh, and I would tend to agree with the likes of Homo rofensis for sure, maybe Gadtin Genesis as well. Hmm. So <laughs> let's, let's also appreciate too, I mean, the, the skulls are great, but it's not just the skulls that are mosaic. Uh, the hands and feet are as well. So we've got fragmentary remains of Homo habilis hands, and they're very, very um, modern Homo sapiens-like. The feet too, these are, well, you know, you would look at this and you would say, well, it looks like a human foot. It's actually a bit primitive when compared to a human foot, uh, anatomically modern human foot. But this certainly isn't the same thing as a chimpanzee's foot. I think that can be readily observed just from a layman's perspective as well. Um, so we're looking at mosaic skulls, we're looking at mosaic hands, and we're looking at mosaic feet. So <laughs> where exactly is the mixed bone bag coming into play? The answer is, of course, that it's not. Um, but when I actually have seen the author of this book, uh, State of the Truth, actually try to talk about it, he tends to jokingly use my example of like, okay, what are we to suppose here that, you know, Australopithecine and a human ran at full speed and slammed into each other and were buried together, and that's why we're finding these bones, you know, partial articulation, like with Australopithecus sediba. And he'll just like say that kind of jokingly, um, and, but then not actually tell me why that's their, not their only option here. Um, how else are you going to get the articulation? How else are you going to get the skulls? So we'll, we'll leave that kind of as it as it stands. Oh, this is Sidiba. Um, there's Naledi as well. This is the one that I was thinking of here. Uh, partials of Homo habilis, but much more complete versions with um, Sidiba, uh, Africanus, and Afrensis. Let me see. But that's not also, yeah, that's also not the only uh, postcrania that we have. I think I just exited out of that other one that I had. Yeah, no, there it is. Um, so this is a timeline of actually some of the other postcranium that we found. Partial limb bones, uh, hands, feet, jaws, teeth. We just have a lot of Homo habilis. Um, and whether it all belongs to Homo habilis or we should split them up in different species, you know my opinion. So allow us to uh, <laughs> kind of close this episode for the time being. I am like having, I'm having a ball. My throat hurts because there's just so much to talk about. There's so much wrong. Um, and we still have half this appendix to go. Like, there's just, it's an unbelievable amount of incorrect information crammed into such a small, illy formatted text. But we're going through it all because that's what I said I was going to do. And then we'll leave a review on Amazon once we can appropriately link this entire playlist so that uh, folks who are considering purchasing the text can do so or decline to do so uh, with an informed position at their fingertips. So, my gentle and, of course, very modern apes. I will see you next time. I'm actually going to directly record the next episode. You know, I'm going to be wearing the same shirt. But I think that an hour and a half, which is probably what this one's going to be, is a bit long. Um, and the next one's probably also going to be quite long. So we'll, we'll cut it here. Have an excellent day and do take care of yourselves. Yeah.